Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here. Today we are doing a very cool mission. We are taking an SSTO that I've made. This is a fresh one from this week. Uh, it's kind of a little bit of an interesting sort of design. It's actually designed to split in half as we actually get into orbit. And uh, the rest of our payload basically heads off to Duna in this case. What you will appreciate from this particular vessel is pretty much all of it can come back safely and be entirely recovered. Well, that's the plan anyway, that's if I can pull it off. You'll see here as I rotate around this thing that we have quite a lot of fuel tanks hanging out the front. That is uh, essentially so we can distribute some weight. But uh, we'll just add some uh, new crew to this, We're adding three brand new crew, completely untrained, two scientists, one engineer. Now this vessel will actually pull more up to orbit if you add a bit more mass to it, so uh, it's quite a versatile little SSTO. And what you will notice here, it has a fairly typical setup just using the uh, typical rapier engines and some nerve rocket motors. The nerve rocket motors are really just there uh, to help assist in our ascent after we leave the atmosphere without losing too much velocity. So the rapier engines are doing most of our grunt work all the way to orbit. And another cool little trick that I've been playing around with this week is just adding an extra little probe core here. And what I've done with this is just rotated it you know, somewhere around 10 degrees or so. And what this means is when we point our vessel then prograde when we're controlling by that probe core is that we can just have a nice steady 10 degree climb without uh, manually doing it. I think the frustrating thing about the default stability assist is that when you point at the nav ball, it doesn't sort of stick to that point. You keep having to readjust and pull your vessel up and keep on adjusting it over and over, which is it's quite frustrating. So I don't know if there's a mod to actually help you with that. I know you can do such things with MechJeb, make it stick. Uh, but yeah, in the stock game, it would be nice if it did this. So you'll see here, as soon as I take off, I basically set the stability assist just to point prograde and you'll just see it just naturally climbs by itself. Uh, I'm actually not touching anything here, I'm just able to sit back, record the footage and uh, basically let it head up into the top of the atmosphere without needing to worry too much about manually flying this thing. As a lot of you are probably well aware, the rapier engines basically don't really kick in a great deal until after you pass 400 meters per second. That's when you really start getting some good acceleration. So after this point, that's when we start manually pulling up and just making sure that we're getting enough velocity before we climb too high. You don't really want to get above 20,000 meters without actually having all of the velocity you can. You don't really want to pull up until you're hitting around 1400 meters per second. So you can see there I've now switched to closed cycle mode, so we're running now on oxidizer as well as liquid fuel. The uh, the closed cycle performance is pretty mediocre really, it's uh, as an engine, as a rocket engine I should say, it's, uh, it's pretty poor, it sort of sits about the middle of the pack compared to other engines, but of course you've got the benefit of it being able to be switched back and forth from closed cycle to air breathing mode, so that's where the benefit of these engines come in. We have of course ditched the fairings there and we're now running on only the nerve rocket motors. As I said at the start of the episode, these are really just there as a supplementary thing. It gives us some extra velocity as we're climbing up to orbit. But we still need the rapier engines in closed cycle mode there to help finalise that circularization. Just finalising that orbit circularization there. And as soon as we do, we can then pop out all of our instruments, our solar panels just so that we can uh, keep our instruments alive and well. We actually have some uh, communication dishes there on our Duna vehicle. And those two dishes will quite easily get a signal all the way back to Kerbin from wherever Duna is sitting in its orbit in relation to Kerbin's orbit. This is a good thing too, because without that connection, we would not have an easy way to set maneuvers or do some of those piloting maneuvers that we would normally be able to do if we actually had a pilot on board, which we don't. Remember, we have only one engineer and two scientists here. So now with our Duna vehicle, we will set up our maneuver to intercept. Of course, we have chosen a launch time that allows us to get to Duna quite efficiently. You'll see down in the bottom right there, we have a phase angle of around 35 to 36 degrees. Essentially there, our maneuver will be around a 1000 meter per second burn in the prograde direction, obviously, so that we can elongate our orbit to meet up there with Duna. So we're going to do this burn in two passes because we're only using the two nerve rocket motors. You can see we have two nerve rocket motors and then we have two swivel engines there as well. The swivel engines will be used to descend down onto Duna and land as well as actually launch off Duna. 
And our Nerf rocket motors there are going to be used for the rest of our journey. You can see we also have a couple of uh, liquid only fuel tanks there uh, underneath the windows on the science unit. So our three rookie pilots now head away from Kerbin for the first time, probably feeling very damn overwhelmed, I would say, uh, that they're all by themselves. They have absolutely no pilot here with any experience. They have no scientist or engineer with any experience either. So yes, if they, uh, they, if they mess this thing up, they're screwed. So now we jump back to our SSTO launcher here and you'll see what I'm doing is pumping a heap of fuel from the rear tanks all the way out into the front tanks. That's because we've ditched that, that uh, Duna launcher. We are now going to have a very large center of lift versus the center of mass problem. Uh, so pumping all that fuel forwards means that we're distributing that weight easily so that we can come down in a nice stable way. Basically just making sure that our center of mass is well in front of that center of lift. So just planning our descent down onto the Kerbal Space Center runway, you'll see what I'm showing you here is a new mod you may not have seen before on my channel called Trajectories. I've actually never used it before, but it is incredibly handy actually. It allows you to essentially simulate how the atmospheric drag is going to affect your vessel, and it'll also tell you where roughly you're going to be landing. And you can keep sort of adjusting this, especially with an SSTO space plane type thing like we've got here, uh, you can keep adjusting this as you're descending. And, you know, this is quite good for a space plane because a space plane, you can just raise the nose, you can uh, uh, obviously lower the nose, so you can really accurately control uh, how you're going to come in here. The thing to kind of understand here with this Trajectories mod as well is that uh, it gets more accurate the closer you get to the target. The further you are away, uh, the more inconsistencies there are with drag and that sort of thing. The Trajectories mod is really good as well because you can also tell it to uh, to simulate as if you were coming in in a retrograde direction or a prograde direction. Now obviously with a space plane we're going to come in in a prograde direction. Uh, you're not going to come in backwards with a space plane. But it's going to be very handy when we come in with our Duna vessel when we're coming to do our aero braking manoeuvres. <laughs> Just descending there like the masterful pilot that I uh, am not. And touchdown there on the runway, we will be recovering 100% the value of this vessel, of course excluding the fuel that we've burned. So yes, that is a very good start to our mission. So we have recovered here $170,000 almost, just a little under that, uh, out of a total of $270,000 if you took note at the start of our mission there. So back to our three rookies on their way to Duna. The next thing they need to do is a mid-course correction just to make sure they're coming into Duna to uh, to intercept quite nicely. We, uh, we don't have a lot of fuel to spare with this thing. It's very tight for this mission, so they need to be very careful. Now, in past missions to Duna, we had a special satellite which was doing all sorts of curb net analysis and we found a number of anomalies and we've marked them on the map for future missions. I haven't actually been back here for quite some time so it's time to actually select one of these anomalies and head down. Now obviously because I've pre-recorded this mission I know exactly which anomaly I was going to find. So what we need to do is aero break over the polar regions so that we're actually going to fall into a polar orbit. This means that we can land anywhere essentially on the planet as long as it passes underneath us at some point. Now, uh, there's a lot of footage that I've cut out here waiting for the appropriate time to do my aero breaks. But after doing this first pass to just drop into a Duna orbit, I basically had all the time in the world to make small adjustments to ensure that I was going to come down basically right over the top of one of these anomalies. Now you can see in that trajectories panel there that I have got selected the retro option there for the descent profile. In this case, because the vessel has that inflatable heat shield on the front, it's uh, it's much more aerodynamic if you're pointing prograde in this, uh, in this case. So uh, having the correct descent profile selected there is really important, otherwise you're going to get uh, kind of a pretty crappy result. So again, as we're descending, we can keep adjusting our position on the nav ball just to push ourselves in certain directions if we're slightly off course. But you can see here the pyramid is coming at us quite quickly here now. We are very, very, very close to it and we're going to land down just nearby easily enough to explore this via EVA. We have the parachutes out and because this is Duna with such a thin atmosphere, we do need to give our engines just a little burst on touchdown just to make sure we don't explode those landing legs. And touchdown there, that was a pretty good landing actually, I was quite happy with that one. 
So we have a lot to do, but the very first thing we're going to do after deploying all of that gear is uh, popping down and planting a flag. This means that all of our Kerbals that are on the vessel will also get the experience points for planting that flag now. Uh, this is a, a new thing as of version 1.2. It did used to be that you needed to actually get every single Kerbal out and plant a flag to get that experience, but no longer. So we will let Sam Bell Kerman, our scientist here, who is currently a rookie, back into that science lab. Now, if we bring out Philster Kerman, who is our engineer, uh, I do quite like the name Philster. Uh, if we bring out Philster, you'll notice that he cannot actually repack the shoots. He is still a level, a level one or a level zero, whatever you call it. Uh, if we now right click on our uh, our science lab, we can level up all of our crew based on the experience that they have earned. You need to have a signal to be able to do this, but uh, you can do that. And now, of course, we can repack those shoots quite fine. So all three of our Kerbals, <laughs> uh, yep, just fell off there. Um, all three of our Kerbals are now level three. So this is great. Our scientists are going to be able to process science more rapidly, and our engineer can do some things like fix wheels and repack shoots now. Uh, in the meantime, we are heading over now to the anomaly. As we get closer and closer to this pyramid, you will start to hear this anomaly. It's a strange signal, very spooky. So that there is the in-game sound. That is captured directly from the game. If you want to find this particular anomaly, uh, you can basically, well, you can copy the position that I've got it here. The positions are very well known on the wiki. If you don't want any spoilers, probably don't do that. You can go searching for it yourself. While Philster is up here, we may as well plant a flag. That's going to let us uh, re-encounter this thing very easily. Next time we'll know exactly where it is. Now, that sound will continue until you get off the top of this pyramid, so I'll turn that down because A, it's pretty annoying when you keep listening to it, and B, we want to speed this back up so that we're not spending too much time uh, with this little tiny stage of our large journey today. So as I zoom out there, you can see a much better snapshot of that pyramid there. It's quite a cool little anomaly. Uh, do suggest you head there next time you're on your next Duna mission. Okay, Philster, it is time to stop mucking around. Back to the vessel you go. We have a lot more science to pick up and process. In we come there, and we'll board you back in. So in our service bay, we have the full range of scientific experiments. Uh, we can grab all these, we can store these as data in our science lab. And because we now have two Kerbal scientists at level three, we can now process this science quite fast, actually, and uh, send it all back to Kerbin. After a few time warps, we can uh, accumulate literally many, many hundreds and hundreds of science points. So we need to wait for a transfer window for Kerbin anyway, so there's no reason why we can't be transferring science all the way back to Kerbin in the meantime. What I actually want to do here is process enough science so that I can uh, re-add all of the rest of the science equipment here as data before we leave, otherwise we're essentially just leaving the data here. So there we go, we can now process that material study as data now. What you can also do, of course, is send your scientist up to uh, pick up all of the science readings from the instruments, and she can bring those down to store those in the actual mobile processing lab. And uh, we can grab some more science on the way back to Kerbin, because there are some biomes that I haven't actually grabbed hold of from orbit, so uh, we can do that at the same time. So it is now time to head back to Kerbin. We'll just make sure that our planet alignment is correct before we launch because we're going to be launching into a polar orbit. It's also very, very important that we launch when our orbit is going to align with the prograde and retrograde direction of the planet Duna. So launching off Duna here now with those two swivel engines. Our thruster weight being very high, seeing as though we don't have a great deal of fuel left in this vessel, it had a thrust to weight ratio of 3.9 there as we lifted off, so uh, plenty of thrust cutting the engines there just before we run out of oxidizer, and this is because we just want a little bit of fuel left for our landing on Kerbin, using now just the Nerve rocket motors to get all the way back. 
Just heading up there towards our apoapsis marker and then we're going to circularise this vessel so that we're uh, in a fairly tight orbit around Duna. There we go. That circularised there quite nicely. So you'll see now why it was so important to time our polar orbit launch perfectly. And this is essentially because we want to escape Duna in one of those two directions generally. Uh, we're going in a retrograde direction this time of course so that we can intercept back with Kerbin. So you can pick up a bunch more science as Duna falls away. Just a very small mid-course correction here to get our intercept with Kerbin just spot on. We have very little fuel left in our vessel. We need a little bit for touchdown, so we really have got nothing left in the tank here to spare. On the way back from Kerbin, you have many, many days to process some more science so you can get those scientists uh, processing science again like crazy. Again, if you're missing any science from the orbit of the sun, you can pick that up and process that as well. So in we come to Kerbin's sphere of influence now, and we'll do a slight radial adjustment here using that trajectories mod again to uh, allow us to come in and fall into Kerbin's orbit. Make sure we don't forget to pull in all of our solar panels before we enter the atmosphere, and we're going to come in in a prograde direction, that is because the inflatable heat shield on the front of this thing is quite tough. We're not actually going to inflate the heat shield. The heat shield is really there for two reasons. Firstly, it will still behave like a heat shield and we aren't actually entering the atmosphere too hard at this altitude. Secondly, the heat shield in this configuration I think looks quite cool. It's a nice top to our vessel and it protects the entire vessel surprisingly well even when we're coming into the atmosphere quite heavily. So in that second pass there, we, uh, we were hitting around 30 kilometers above the surface. This pass here is going to bring us down just under 180 kilometers for our apoapsis. And you can see there that the heat shield wasn't even really breaking a sweat. So a very small prograde adjustment here so that we can get that trajectories mod to show us landing roughly around the Kerbal Space Center. We don't need to be bang on, we're not going to get it perfectly close, but uh, the closer we get, the more we can recover from this vessel. So as I was skimming off the top of the atmosphere here, I was noticing that uh, the trajectories mod was telling me I was going to overshoot the Kerbal Space Center by quite a bit, so I can turn retrograde to, uh, to wipe off a little more velocity quicker, and that then drops us down further with our trajectory's uh, crosshair there. <laughs> and I probably should have stayed pointing in the retrograde direction because I nearly overshot this into the ocean. Parachutes out there, and uh, as we come down, we just need to give our engines just a little burst on touchdown so we don't explode anything on the vessel. Down we come here, our velocity just at around 12 meters per second. <laughs> and a nice gentle touchdown, yes! So recovering the vessel there, we have returned with over 1,000 science, but we transferred much, much more than that on our mission. Also recovered almost 97% the value of the vessel because we landed so close to that Kerbal Space Center. So uh, we've basically refunded the entire cost of our vessel for this mission with the exception of the fuel. We also trained up three rookie Kerbals to level three, so that's another bonus as well. So today I have three flags to plant at the Minmus base for three very excellent subscribers of the channel. The first here for Linventor, who was drawn a random comment from that particular video. The next flag goes to Charlie Kelly, who uh, was also drawn as a random comment. He has a YouTube channel of his own, actually, so you can check that out here. And the next flag goes to Max Mondo, who deciphered the hidden thumbnail message the other week. Very well done, mate. That was a pretty tricky one that you got there in regards to Crichton from Red Dwarf. So I hope you enjoyed that video. Thanks for watching. Please take a second. Give it a thumbs up. All of your support has been just amazing. If you have any questions for me, whack them down in the comments below. Thank you to all of you awesome subscribers. And for those that haven't yet subscribed, please do so. Follow me on Twitter at Marcus House Game if you want a few other tidbits. And uh, yes, we'll see you in the next video. On the edge there. Now we'll just roll this over. Come on, you were supposed to flawlessly fall into the ocean. Wiggling around, and there we go. Off it goes there into the ocean. Now, the landing legs that we have here are uh, purely to absorb the impact.